Hello, I'm Armin Budish. Welcome to Golden Opportunities. Today, obesity is now considered a disease, and this new classification could mean help for overweight elders. We'll weigh in with the facts. Then, are you better than the average investor? Our report on returns may surprise you. And we'll provide assurance about the changes in health care insurance. Plus, we'll help you lighten up with a beautiful Thanksgiving centerpiece. And it will help you avoid dangerous pitfalls with long-term care insurance. It's time to get geoing, so pull up a chair and join us at our kitchen table for Golden Opportunities. Last June, the American Medical Association joined many other organizations in officially recognizing obesity as a disease. This decision was not made lightly. So why does it matter? Dr. Eileen Seeholzer will weigh in with the answer for us, plus what it means especially for seniors. Dr. Seeholzer is the director of the Obesity and Weight Management Program at Metro Health. Thanks for joining us. Glad to be Appreciate here. it. Why does obesity qualify as a disease? Well, it qualifies as a disease for two reasons. The first one is that anytime we have a, a disease or a chronic condition in this case, it's something that can't be cured, it has to be managed. So folks who have obesity, whether they're just staying the same weight and trying to keep their other health conditions at bay or losing weight and keeping it off, have to do things over their lifetime. It's not like an infection where you can cure it. But the second piece is that one of the reasons we can't just keep it off and ignore it is that there's changes in our body that can be permanent, especially when we get to moderate or severe obesity. Some of those fat cells don't just get endlessly bigger when we gained weight, they multiply. And then when we lose the weight, we end up with more fat cells than we started with, and those changes aren't necessarily reversible. So even though you lose weight, you still have more fat cells than when you were thin at the beginning. Right. And all of the mechanisms for this um, aren't clear, but one of the reasons many people who've lost weight and kept it off have shown for years that it's harder to keep it off than if you never gained more to begin with have to do with that physiology. Huh. Are older adults more at risk than others? Or are they at risk? Well, or we do. do, we, we I mean, do how does that work? Uh, so so we, we become more at risk for obesity as we age, um, and the younger we have obesity, the more likely we are to get complications from it. Um, the uh, older Americans may be particularly at more risk because they may have more fat than they realize. Um, one of the things is at any weight you may have a body composition that is less muscle and fat because you're not active and as we get older that becomes more likely. So that leads to obesity yes. as we get older. Okay, so suggestions. How do we fight back? <laughs> so like all these things, in addition to uh, uh, using the scale to know where we're at, um, we also want to usually check our waist circumference because a larger waist um, can confer a higher risk for heart attack and stroke. And knowing your weight and your waist um, help you know your body mass index and your risk. Then you want to basically help your muscles get stronger and help your body movement, your heart stay uh, stronger too. So it's aerobic work and uh, muscle building activity for your uh, weight overall and healthy eating. So aerobic work would be walking, walking? swimming, water aerobics, bike. And building things. muscles is? Usually what we call resistance work where you use dumbbells or machines or your body is the weight for things like push-ups, things like that. What's weightlifting do for us? I mean, so we, one of the things most people know is if you don't use muscle, you lose muscle. Um, and one of the pieces for most of us is we don't do manual work anymore and so we start out older age with less muscle often than we used to. So one of the pieces, especially after menopause for women where we lose a lot of weight, um, is that, um, or we lose, I'm sorry, one of the things that menopause when women stop making hormones is they tend to lose muscle at an extra fast rate. So it's particularly important for women to be doing things where they're using weights or using their body as a weight to keep strong. Eating. If I want to avoid obesity is eating candy and snacks and stuff, is that why I look like I do and you look like you do? You don't eat this? <laughs> Uh, not much, um, but but uh, and actually it has been shown that sugar pop and fast food directly do lead to increased obesity. We certainly know sedentary lifestyle, not being active does. Um, one of the things if you think of ourselves in kind of caveman terms is, is we really do need to have kind of a healthy plate approach for most people to um, stay healthy. Um, 
some people can get away with it, but most people do need to move more toward that healthy plate to stay, to stay at a better weight. Well, I, I'm particularly fascinated by your comments earlier that you know, if we gain weight, it's harder to, uh, we, we keep more of the fat cells, which I assume then makes it harder, makes it easier to gain weight in the future. Correct, correct. And, and uh, you know, I joke with my patients that y you're right, it's not fair, it is harder. Um, and that's fair. why that diet, um, that healthy plate where we really focus on vegetables and the lean protein is important too, because more of those carbs and sugars and fats um, drive us towards storing energy and not burning energy. So it, it is unfortunately, you can't pick diet or exercise. If you want the best result for you, you gotta do both. Well, thank you very much for the good information. And I'm never gonna eat <laughs> potato chips or candy again, wow. ever. <laughs> Obesity is hazardous to your health. Maybe if we think of it as an illness, a disease, we'll take it more seriously. Follow Dr. Seeholzer's advice and check your waist measurement and body mass index or BMI. Have the doctor do that. Then take the necessary steps and weights and food servings to achieve a healthier way of life. My thanks to Dr. Seeholzer for shedding light on this pretty heavy topic. Find out more by calling Metro Health at 216-778-7800 or visit www.metrohealth.org. Want more Metro Health medical information? Be sure to tune in to WTAM 1100 each Saturday morning at 7 for Metro Health and You, hosted by Dr. Christine Alexander. Next, many happy returns? But first, this 19th century author famously focused his fiction on the infighting in France. In real life, his personal politics even persuaded him to part ways with the perfection of Paris. In fact, he elected to endure 19 years of exile. Can you name this writer who was made miserable by this move? We'll finish his tale when we return. I know the devastating effects that back pain can have not just on you, but your entire family. Instead of covering up your pain with drugs or surgery, we offer a procedure called non-surgical decompression. Decompression increases spinal disc space and it draws nutrients back into the disc. This allows healing to take place from the inside out. So if you're suffering with chronic pain, there is hope. I invite you to call our office to see if this proven treatment option can mean freedom from your pain. His father may have been one of Napoleon's generals, but Victor Hugo wrote off his dad's politics and, for a time, his own country. He chose to protest with prose, putting his political perspective in his famous fiction, including The Hunchback of Notre Dame and Les Miserables. Here's the bottom line. We put our money in, in stocks to create more cash than we might have if those dollars sat in a safe savings account. But is that what's really happening? Jim Lineweaver's here to report on the returns coming in and, spoiler alert, many of us are not investing very well. Jim's a certified financial planner with the Lineweaver Financial Group. Thanks for joining us today, Jim. Thanks for having me. So, how are most of us doing with our investments? Well, if they're not sitting down yet this morning, they should probably grab a cup of coffee and, <laughs> and yeah. sit down. But they're not doing well, and that's the problem. And the reason is Dal Bark recently came out with a study, and the studies always run a little late, but their most recent one ended for the results with December 31st, 2011, and it said the average investor over the last 20 years only made 2.1%. That's investors. Yes. It's not now, somebody putting money in a savings account or having it in a CD and they didn't go into the market. These were people that had money in the market. They are investors and they only made 2.1 percent. Well, is that because the market was only doing 2.1 percent over those 20 years? No, not at all. If you were invested in the equity market, let's say by the S&P 500, which is a basket of 500 stocks that the McGraw-Hill Corporation feels are a good barometer of our economy, that was actually up 7.8 percent. Okay. Barclays Capital U.S. Aggregate Bond Index for fixed income investors was up 6.5% in the same period of time. And if you blended the two together with about a 50-50 mix, you're actually up 7.2%, considerably higher. 
Now, is are these numbers based on inflation? Do they take into these don't no? no. So that's even worse for the average investor because inflation, as measured by the consumer price index for the same period of time, was actually at two point five percent. So that means the average investor lost money during that period of time when adjusted for inflation. Well, I'm not sure why we're doing so bad. Then um, we want to buy low and we want to sell high. Uh, but even if we didn't hit the marks, why are we so far behind the market in our investments? And the problem is people get emotions involved in their portfolio. And although nobody can time the market, you can't you know, buy at the exact low, you can't sell at the exact high, what's going to happen is that usually as, as t trends move or maybe as the markets come up like it has done recently, people feel they're going to miss out maybe on a big move, so they're going to jump in, not realizing that the market's done extremely well, more than doubled since 2008. So, so is it that we're picking bad stocks? or are we picking the right stocks but selling them and buying them at the wrong times? Well, what this study showed is that they didn't really look at you know some of the individual holdings. It looked at overall total return. It found that people's behavior of when they bought and sold, not so much what they bought and sold, was, so the, was behind... Is is yeah. a problem and more emotions. than anything yeah. else. And emotions, because yeah. you, you, you get scared or you, you know. Yeah, and so, that's why sometimes what happens if you can remove yourself from that or deal with a professional that can get those emotions out of it, deal with the facts and what's going on in the economy and everything, sometimes it's no guarantee, but sometimes they can have better results. Yeah, so tell us about how we get those better results. I mean, what would a professional do to help us? Well, sometimes, well, they're usually going to be tied into the market more. I mean, I can't tell you how many people say, oh, I just heard about this stock or that. Should I run out and buy it? You know, right, just, right, right. Can I get it? this penny stock for a couple of dollars a share and you know you're not going to get that with professional investors they're not going to try to get on the latest rumor the you know to, to make a ton of money they're going to stick to more fundamentals look at what's going on in the economy and over time hopefully they should outperform your average investor great thanks Jim appreciate that very much if you want your ROI to mean a good return on investment and not running out of income be sure to review and rebalance your portfolio and get help. This is difficult. Average investors just have, are not experts. Go see a professional. If you want Jim to look over your portfolio, he'll do it for free. Give him a call. The number's up next. information, call the Line Weaver Financial Group at 1-888-313-4009 or log on to www.lineweaver.net. Next, an update on Obamacare. Looking for places to go, things to do? Welcome to our community calendar. Enjoy a spirited discussion this Wednesday at the Independence Library from 7 to 8 p.m. County archivist Judy Santina will share stories about the spirits in the Rhodes Mansion, as well as additional information about the county archives. To scare up more information, call 216-447-0160 or take a haunting look at this website, www.cuyahogalibrary.org. We're less than two months away from big changes in health care. January 1st, 2014, many parts of the Affordable Care Act, also known as Obamacare, will take effect. Greg Young is here to hit some of the highlights. Greg's the Director of Strategic Policy and Initiatives at Medical Mutual of Ohio. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. First of all, how does the new health care law affect Medicare and Medicaid? Well, let's talk about Medicaid first because I think that's the most significant in terms of the impact it's going to make. One of the big goals of the Affordable Care Act, obviously, is to uh, cover those who are not covered. Okay. The thought was that by having this Medicaid expansion in all 50 states, we were going to cover 15 million people. So, you know, what we're doing is we're expanding it to people making 133% of federal poverty level, which means 14,400 for an individual, 29,300 family of four. All right. Now, that expansion is up to the state, if I understand correctly, and 
That's correct. Where and are we in Ohio? Ohio hasn't yet decided to do that, if I'm remembering correctly. You're remembering correctly. About half the states have decided to do it. In Ohio, uh, the governor wants to do it, but he's bumped into some political opposition, so it's still up in the air. Yeah, and uh, I won't ask you your opinion on it. I know my opinion, and Medicaid expansion makes a lot of sense, but uh, we're not there yet in Ohio. Okay. Many of our viewers are on Medicare. Uh -huh. What can they expect when Obamacare goes into effect? And, and that's a great question. The important thing with Medicare for people to realize is that, you know, if they don't do anything, they're going to maintain their existing coverage. But what are the changes? You know, they get the free annual wellness prevention of visits and screenings, which are so very important. And also very important is when you look at uh, Medicare Part D or the prescription drugs, there's always been a problem with that donut hole or coverage yeah, gap right. where they hit that point where they're paying a lot more well by 2020 that's going to be completely gone in 2010 it was cut in half so the affordable care act has certainly helped seniors with that cost. so right now we're paying we're still in that 50 percent right then we have an incremental decrease down to it being closed in 2020 so eventually um, no more donut hole. Right, absolutely. Wow, great. All right, so if we don't fall into Medicare or Medicaid, mm -hmm. then what? The Affordable Care Act very carefully defines what acceptable coverage is, and Medicare, Medicaid are certainly acceptable coverage. Employer-sponsored insurance, but how about those people who don't have it? The law is uh, insistent via that tax that they get coverage. Now, if someone doesn't have coverage, they don't get it, they're going to pay a penalty. Um, the good thing for individuals is historically they have not had that comprehensive coverage that people have had in group insurance. With essential health benefits, with the changes that we see, that's going to change. Um, if you've been denied insurance coverage, um, maybe because of a pre-existing health condition, Will that, tell us how that is impacted. It's going to be very significantly impacted. We've had, um, historically, there's been people who've had disabilities. They've had that pre-existing condition, as you mentioned. Um, that goes away in 2014. Also, important to note that, you know, the lifetime limit, say it's $3 million and they have some significant illness and they hit that spend and don't have coverage anymore, that also goes away. So, very important. So, if we don't have insurance, we can sign up for it will we be able to afford it? It's interesting. I think a lot of people will be surprised to know that the level of subsidies that exist out there to help uh, people purchase coverage, up to 400% of federal poverty level for a family of four, around $90,000. Wow. So very significant help purchasing coverage. Great. Greg, great information. As always, thanks for coming My back. My pleasure. Appreciate Thank you for having me. It. The new year will bring a much needed shot in the arm to our health care system, especially for those who have been without health insurance. To learn more about how you can benefit, use the website that's coming up next. My thanks to Greg Young for giving us the right dose of information. Learn more about Medical Mutual of Ohio by visiting their website, www.medmutual.com. Next, other ideas can't hold a candle to this craft. It's time to get up and go, an exercise minute on golden opportunities. Hello everybody, I'm Mike Carbon from Breakout Fitness and today we're here to show you how to work the shoulders by doing a lateral to front raise. This is an excellent multi-movement exercise that will help us strengthen those shoulders. You ready to go? I'm ready. Alright, we have our dumbbells here. For this one we're going to be standing tall. We want the dumbbells to be facing our hips as we start. We're simply going to raise them laterally to the side at about shoulder height, bring them right back down to the starting position, immediately bring them to the front shoulder height, back down to the quad, and then out to the side. Now that was one repetition. We're looking for 12 to 15 here. Slow and controlled movements. Don't arch your back. Don't sway too much. Just make sure you have the weight under control and you're breathing. How are you feeling? <laughs> it's easier the way I'm doing it. Yeah, that looks good. <laughs> Just keep your arms a little straighter. You got it. All right, everybody. Remember to breathe. Slow and controlled movements and you'll have stronger shoulders. And now it's your turn to get up and go. For your copy of the exercise booklet, please send $1 for postage to Golden Opportunities, 23240 Chagrin Boulevard, Suite 450, Beachwood, Ohio, 44122. Thrifty, easy, and no special tools needed. That's what creative crafter Jenny 
Barnett Roars promises for the Thanksgiving centerpiece that we're going to make today. And that makes me thankful. Jenny's the founder of CraftTestDummies.com. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. My pleasure. And I'm looking at these finished products. They look very pretty. And you're going to tell you. me that we can take a regular old candle and make them pretty like that. Yes, actually things that you can find at the box store, the drug store, even the dollar store, and you can put this together for just like under $10. Well, be careful what you say. You said you can do this. I'm not sure I can we do this. Can but, do <laughs> so show us what we can do and okay. how easy it is. It's so easy. So first of all, what you're going to need are some candles and you can use regular candles or the flameless variety. Okay. You're going to want some pretty napkins or maybe if you're an advanced crafter and you have some pretty stamps and some markers and some scissors for cutting and then a little bit of decoupage medium and there are different brands out there. You might even already have some sitting in the closet somewhere from your kids crafting days. Oh, I'm days. sure. Right so, in my closet. Right in the closet. So what you're going to do is you're going to take your candle. You don't have to do any prep at all. And what we're going to do is um, use one of these little napkins that I've already cut out. Here's yours. You, you'll notice that there are two layers. Your napkins do come with the backing layer. So you're going to want to remove that clear one. There you okay. go. And now, honestly, I like to use my finger. You can use a paintbrush, but I'm just going to take a dab of the glue and kind of rub on a thin coat on one side of the candle like so. Okay. Mm -hmm. Just like this. All right. Smear it on. And then, notice, notice that fancy technique I just did. I pick it up and place it on the candle. And now you're just going to kind of tap it down. This is where being light-handed, being gentle is good. And then dab a little more glue on and tap it down just like on the so. top? Just on top, right. So decoupage is the idea of cutting and then encapsulating it in a decoupage medium. And we use decoupage instead of just white glue because it's meant to be a top coat, so it'll be resilient. It looks all white and yucky. It, you know what, the nice thing though is that it dries completely clear, just hmm. like this one here. So what you'll do is just finish it, put it to the side, and when it's all dry, you may want to go ahead and add a little bit of raffia to finish it off. Or like what I is did, raffia? It's like um, a natural material, kind of like a little twine. This like, mm -hmm. this That's like. the raffia. And then okay. with this one, I actually just added a little charm on top. But this is a great way to get kids or grandkids involved. Get together, make the centerpiece so that then on Thanksgiving, you can really enjoy it together as a family. Oh, or you can try that too. <laughs> now, I usually wait till it dries until after oh, I put the Oh, you're not supposed to put it on. I thought no, you're you supposed to glue it. To no, it. no, no. You just tie that around at the end. Oh, it's kind of it's very easy. And if you do like to do the stamping, you can just go ahead and stamp on it using um, an alcohol ink, and then just give it a little color, and then glue that on to a different candle. Now, one question I have: Sure. Though. We, when we light the candle, do we burn all this stuff? It's just paper. That's an excellent question. Well. For most candles, you'll notice they do things like this. They actually will bur burn down into the middle of the candle, so you don't have to worry about it hurting the outside. Or you can use a flameless candle or drop a tea light in. But normally, I don't find a problem. But as always, don't leave a burning candle unattended. Very Be good. safe. All right, thank you very much. All right, so this Thanksgiving, you can not only bask in the glow of your loved one's faces, you can also enjoy the glow from your custom-made candles that sit at the center of your table. I'm thankful Jenny Barnett Roars was in our kitchen to help cook up this idea. And for more great ideas, use the information that's coming up next. For more great craft ideas, click to www.crafttestdummies.com. Next, avoiding long-term care pitfalls. Sometimes it's about beating the clock. Sometimes it's about beating fate. And sometimes it's about beating the unimaginable. But there's one opponent our team loves to beat more than any other. We love beating the odds. We are the Metro Health System. We are the proud sponsor of the comeback. For some people, long-term care insurance can be a wise investment to protect your life savings from the costs of a debilitating illness. But before buying a policy, you have to make sure that you understand the fine print. Otherwise, over the long term, you may be paying a lot and getting very little. Here to explain is my very fine law partner, Mike Solomon. Thanks for joining Hi, us, Mike. You've made a list of uh, several hidden pitfalls in long-term care policies. 
first is check out how the waiting period is calculated. Right. Let's, okay, most policies have a waiting period between 30 and 100 days. That period, you're on your own. You have to pay your own expenses, and after that, you get coverage. But how do they calculate that waiting period is important. So, for example, let's say you have, um, you're at home, you have home health care three days a week, and you have a 60-day waiting period. Is the waiting period means 60 calendar days, which would be around eight weeks, or is it 60 caregiving days, you know, three days a week, which would be closer to 20 weeks? So it's a big difference. Oh, very important. All right. Second hidden pitfall, check out the qualifications which a caregiver must meet to get paid under the policy. Okay, now most policies require you to have a state licensed home health care provider. Some don't. Some let you l use non-licensed people and that can be a big difference. Again, let's say you're getting $75 a day for home health care. If, if you can use a friend or a neighbor or a child who isn't licensed, maybe you only have to pay them $10 an hour. If you have to use a state licensed home health care giver, that might be $25 an hour, gives you a lot less care. Sounds good. All right, last one. Your third one, research how much hassle the home caregiver will face in order to get paid. Right, well you should contact the insurance company you're, you're, you're dealing with before you sign up and find out what the process is to get your home health care people paid. Sometimes there's a lot of, a, very paper, a lot of paperwork and you might want to contact a home health care agency and ask them if they've had any experience with this insurance company. I've read stories where it's sometimes so difficult for these people to get paid, they end up suing the, the person they're providing care to to get their wow. money. So wow, you don't wow, want wow. And preventing these problems? Well, obvious. Take a look at the document before you sign it and if, you, and if they're usually legalese, so you might want to sit down with an elder law attorney, have them look at it because they may spot them some things you haven't even thought about. Good advice and, and good cautions. Thanks, Mike. You're welcome. Long-term care is very expensive and can cost you your life savings. Long-term care insurance is one way to protect yourself. But these policies contain pitfalls, so be careful. For more information, give Mike Solomon a call. Call Butish, Solomon, Steiner, and Peck at 1-888- 236-5173 for more information or to schedule a speaker for your organization or log on to www.beautishandsolomon.com Thanks for joining us on next week's show As You Age, Is Your Good Back Going Bad? We've got straightforward advice. We'll help you smile as you think of things to be thankful for. Fearful of family feuds during the upcoming festive season? We'll offer advice to make the holidays happier. And PT has many people A-OK. -okay. We'll work out why physical therapy produces so many success stories. Until next week, please remember to make the most of your golden opportunities.